Should be on. Sergeants, uh, will you start your recordings? According to the computer, all set. Thank you. Sergeant Biondo, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the fiscal year 2022 executive budget hearing on the Committee of Finance jointly with the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, we ask you to please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you plan on testifying for the executive budget, the date to do so is May 25th, 2021, beginning at 10 a.m. Again, that is May 25th, 2021, beginning at 10 a.m. If you'd like to submit testimony, please do so to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chairs Drum and Chair Rose. We are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's first day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Youth Services, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Debbie Rose, and we will be joined later by the public advocate, Jamani Williams. We're also joined by my colleagues in the council, and um, let me just grab the names, Council Members uh, Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Brooks Powers, Chin, Diaz, Grudenchik, Lewis, Powers, Riley, Rosenthal, Van Bremer, uh, Ayala, and Cornegy. Uh, for the first time in a long time, we have a lot of really good things to talk about in the executive budget for the Department of Youth and Community Development. DYCD's executive budget totals $835.4 million, up $90 million from its preliminary budget just three months ago. The increase is largely due to federal reserve, uh, excuse me, federal re revenue received from President Biden's stimulus package to support youth programming. Notably, the executive budget includes 144.3 million to fully fund the summer youth employment program so that 75,000 youth have the chance to gain meaningful employment experience this summer. This is up 5,000 slots and $13 million when compared to the preliminary. After last year's bitter battle to preserve the program from draconian cuts proposed by the mayor, the council is relieved that this issue does not need to be relitigated for fiscal 2022. The executive budget also includes funding for a new program, Summer Rising, which will be managed jointly by DYCD and DOE. As laid out by the mayor, this program will be a citywide school-based summer program for DOE students in kindergarten through 12th grade. It will be free to all who apply with a guaranteed seat. Summer Rising will incorporate DOE's academic programming with DYCD's school-based enrichment programming through existing Compass, Sonic, and Beacon contracts. And speaking of those contracts, the council cheers the restoration of $5.7 million for Summer Sonic, $6.6 .6 million over two years for the baseline expansion of Beacon and Cornerstone programming, and the $12.8 million baseline to fund DYCD's community-based network of providers through the Indirect Rate Initiative. This is all welcome news, not only because so many youth will be served in this critical year when we will need additional support to recover from the various losses they have felt over the past year. But it is also a win for the providers who for the first time in many years will have ample time to plan for their robust summer programs with the certainty, with the certainty by, the end, by the end of April that, is, that the necessary funding will be appropriated. However, while there is much to be happy about, there are still a few items that the council will need to see included in the adopted budget that are not in the executive budget. Principally, we need to see at least $20 million baseline uh, for our work, learn, and grow 
and the restoration of $12 million for the adult literacy program. We look forward to uh, continuing to work with DYCD and the administration as a whole to ensure that these programs are sustained. Uh, I wanna thank Michelle Peregrine and Isha Wright from the Finance Division for the preparation for today's hearings. I'd also like to take a moment to say thank you and goodbye to Sarah Gestellum, uh, the trust, a trusted member of the Finance Division for seven years who primarily covered housing and public housing. She left to go to work in the mayor's office a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't yet had the chance to publicly thank her for her work and her dedication. So thank you, Sarah, and you will certainly be missed. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to Chair Rose, and then I uh, understand that the public advocate has joined us uh, for his opening statement as well. Chair Rose. Thank you, Chair Drum, um, and good morning, everybody. I am Council Member Debbie Rose. I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And I am so pleased to be joined here by all of my esteemed fellow council members, as well as the public advocate, Jamani Williams. Today, we will hear from DYCD Commissioner Bill Chong, Chief Finance Officer Jadine Fanor, along with the agency's team of program-specific deputies and the associate commissioners, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. We gather for our, for my last budget hearing as chair of the Youth Services Committee. As elected officials and fierce advocates for youth, my colleagues and I have worked tirelessly to perform the functions we have been charged with, to provide an equitable and fair budget, including life-changing youth services throughout the five boroughs. After last year's major misstep with SYEP, and a pandemic that has isolated young people and exacerbated inequality, our fellow New Yorkers need us now more than ever to be focused on what is in this fiscal 22 um, budget. So I commence my role in conducting this oversight hearing of the city's budget, beginning with the Department of Youth Services. This is the first that Youth Services is um, the first executive budget hearing. and. Um, before I go on, I wanna congratulate DYCD and Commissioner Chong on, 25, on their 25th anniversary. DYCD's fiscal 2022 executive budget totals $835.4 million and has a net change of 90 million more than its fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, which is an indication to me that the city is moving toward prioritizing its youth and communities in this budget through the application of federal stimulus grants that were received. And I am more than relieved to see this. DYCD's executive budget alone added $270.1 million in new federal grants across the plan, which will support relief related programs for one year like learning labs and summer rising. <clears throat> These grants help restore Summer Sonic, add funds to SYEP for 5,000 additional one-time slots, and baseline the indirect cost rate initiative, while also expanding services to our community centers at our beacons and our cornerstones. This city and this executive budget is clearly placing its funds into programs and prioritizing vital services to bolster communities and youth so devastated by this pandemic. The plan also adds a total of 28.5 million in city tax levy funding that is baselined in the budget beginning in FY22 into the out years for services for runaway and homeless youth or RHY, including Unity Works and the new workforce development program for runaway homeless youth LGBTQI plus participants, as well as the DYCD expansion of summer uh, of, of Saturday Night Lights or SNL, not to be mistaken with the TV show. Um, a program partnered with the city district attorneys and NYPD to force the positive relations between youth and law enforcement through recreational activities on weekend evenings. From experience and looking back to last year's executive budget hearing, 
we are certainly beginning in far better shape than usual, to say the very least. I am grateful, and most importantly, I know these effective programs are benefiting from this improved budget and will help so many New Yorkers in need who are so deserving of this and so much more. I have only one concern with this budget, and that is due to Work, Learn, Grow not being funded at all to begin services this fall. I am sure after all of our negotiations to baseline 4,000 Compass Elementary slots to fund all summer youth program last year and the year over year bouts to restore and expand Summer Sonic, you can see how I'm ever so prepared to make sure I get work, learn, grow baselined in this budget before my tenure is up. With more than 2.6 million vaccinated New Yorkers, city fully reopening on July 1st, we move towards a new sense of normalcy, I hope. I want to charge the administration with one final task, ensuring that our youth return to a fully open city with fully funded programs for all youth. So I sincerely ask that you work with my team, myself, and my fellow council members to ensure this process plays out smoothly as we work to get to adoption. With that, I would like to take just a moment to reflect back on the seven budget hearings we have met to deliberate and negotiate together. Commissioner Chong, both you and I um, will part from this trust th these positions later this year. I want to thank you and your team for the work you all do to lift up our young people and secure the incredible programming delivered by DYCD. I know you and your teams have worked so hard to ensure DYCD funded programs evolve and can enrich those that are designed to serve. And my fellow council members on the Youth Services Committee, I could not have fought the great fight without you, without you championing these noble causes alongside of me. I want to thank you all. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be your chair. And Chair Drum, thank you for your incredible leadership and thank you for your fearless pursuit of what is really right and fair for New Yorkers across this magnificent city. And to our speaker, Corey Johnson, I want to thank you for always rolling up your sleeves and going toe to toe to make sure that the voices of the members of this legislative body are heard by the mayor. And I cannot thank Latonya McKinney enough for keeping us informed, guided, and grounded through the entire process of adopting the city's budget year after year. I have no many, I have no idea how you do it but you do it with dignity and grace. And I'm grateful to you for your know-how and sheer tenacity to get it done right. And my whole team in council finance who keep me informed and fact-checked, starting with Regina Parita Ryan, my all-knowing steadfast deputy and her team, including Aisha Wright, Aisha Wright, unit head, and Michelle Peregrine, my financial analyst, who all worked so hard on these reports to prepare me for these hearings. I thank you, Team Finance. You totally rock. And I also just want to thank Christine Johnson, my Chief of Staff, Issa Cortez, my Legislative and Budget Director, Christian Ravello. I want to thank Emma, Emmy Briggs, the Counsel to the Committee, Anastasia Zanina, the Policy Analyst to this committee, and Elizabeth Arts, our Community Engagement and just so many others who have worked to, so hard in their roles to make this committee a success. I wouldn't be where I am today without you. Thank you. I look forward to a meaningful and final budget hearing. And next, we will hear from public advocate, Jermani Williams. And thank you again, Chair Drum. And I turn the hearing back over to you to begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rose. And thank you for your very kind words. Let me also just compliment you and say that you have done a spectacular job as chair of the Youth Services Committee. You are a real fighter for our youth here in the city. I feel extremely uh, fortunate and privileged to have worked with you 
over the last 12 years. Um, we're members of the same class, the incoming class. I see Margaret Chin as well is here. She's a member of that class. And uh, it's been the privilege of our lives, I think, to be able to serve in this capacity. So thank you, Chair Rose, for everything that you've done uh, in your tenure here in the New York City Council. Thank you. Love you. you. <laughs> OK. All right. Next, we have uh, our public advocate, Jamani Williams, who I've also had the privilege to serve with. Uh, and he's done a spectacular job. Um, as the public advocate, but also to serve with him here in the city council. He was a member of our class uh, yeah. when we first came in in 2010. Public advocate. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, yeah. uh, Drum. Uh, yes, I believe our class uh, did stir up a bit of trouble uh, these past few years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good trouble, as they might say. Uh, but I want to say uh, thank you, uh, Chair Jump, for those kind words and and um, the the yeoman's work that you did in the uh, as the chair uh, put forth some pretty impressive uh, budgets. So congratulations on that. I'm uh, looking forward uh, to a, another one uh, this year. I think yesterday, hopefully. Last year's was a bit of an anomaly, and we'll, we'll make up for uh, for what we did. And uh, Chair Rose, as was mentioned, you did an amazing job as the youth chair. So thank you for for all of that. And I want to lend myself to all the words you both said about uh, the staff that you mentioned as we go through this uh, last budget. So congratulations, and hopefully we can do some do some more damage in this budget coming up here. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams. I'm a public advocate for the City of New York. Again, I want to thank both chairs and the Committee on Youth Services for holding this very important executive budget hearing today. Last week, uh, the mayor announced the executive budget for fiscal year 2022 as part of the financial plan. The city plans to allocate roughly 594.4 million toward the Department of Youth and Community Development. The administration has taken the right steps to provide additional funding to guarantee more opportunities for our youth. The mayor's plan to restore $186 million in funding to the Learning to Work and Arts program and providing 200 million to Summer Rising to accommodate 190,000 youth this summer. Summer Rising gives young people in grades K through eight the ability to participate in academic and recreational activities throughout the summer, while providing high school students with the opportunity to engage in programs offering work experience and internship opportunities, such as the Summer Youth Employment Program, also known as SYP. Speaking of SYP, it is important to highlight the additional $13 million that will be invested to add 5,000 uh, spots to CUNY summer youth employment. I am pleased to see the administration is demonstrating a commitment to ensuring more young people will engage in professional development, community building, and social emotional learning activities this summer. I appreciated uh, Commissioner Chong's words uh, in the last hearing that he was going to do more uh, to push for these uh, funds to be restored. While the mayor's executive budget is proposing an increase to funding and youth services, there were cuts to certain programs in the preliminary budget proposal that need more, not less investment. Uh, even besides the pandemic, we generally seem to be uh, applauding ourselves for restoring cuts uh, when in fact we should have been asking for more cuts from the beginning. Uh, I am curious, I'm sorry, more funding to the beginning, uh, not just restoring the cuts that were made. I'm curious as to whether or not the administration will provide additional funding to the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program or RHY. At the preliminary budget hearing held by this committee in March, we, uh, I, and along with others, stress the importance of RHY with respect to our homeless youth, especially those who identify as LGBTQI, and how the administration's proposed decrease in funding by 3.3% at the time was unacceptable. Even though the executive budget funding allocation for this program is closer to the amount of the previous fiscal year, we'd like to reiterate that the city needs to be investing more money into RHY. At that same hearing, Commissioner Chong explained the funding, albeit decrease, will support 813 beds and eight drop-in centers for runaway and homeless youth with a homeless youth population of nearly 4,600 individuals, 813 beds is simply not enough. We need to do better in ensuring that every homeless young person has a place to sleep at night until they transition into permanent housing. Calling on the administration to designate more funding to DY City specifically for the RHY program, the intention is not only to increase the number of beds, but enhance the services. Although more investment is needed to, needs to be in provided shelter to our runaway and homeless youth, it is good to see that the city is making efforts to provide them with access to more social services and job opportunities. Last month, the administration announced a partnership with NYC, uh, NYC Unity Project and Ali Forney Center, which is the nation's largest LGBTQI homeless youth services provider to launch the NYC Unity Works program. 
starting the summer unity works will admit 90 young people who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. The three year program will provide homeless youth with job skills, training and career development opportunities, help them access public benefits, food and clothing and administer mental health support. The unity works program will be extremely beneficial for our LGBTQI runaway and homeless youth. And I hope this initiative will be codified into city law as a way of ensuring these critical services will remain available for the LGBTQI community for many years to come. Given the pandemic's impact on our personal lives over the last year and the fact that we are on a path to fully reopening as a city, we have to take into consideration the extent to which young people want to be out and active this summer, whether in a job or industry or hard skills training or a recreational program or just getting the essential skills that people need. Young people do not want to be idle. They want to be engaged. SYP will likely provide 70,000 spots this year, which is still below the program's pre-pandemic enrollment number of 75,000. The availability of 70,000 open spots also means not every young person who applies will be accepted. Nevertheless, every youth who applies should be given an opportunity to participate in an alternative program. At the last budget hearing, youth advocates pitched the idea of SYP Unbound, which would ensure every student who is not selected for SYP is enrolled in a program that provides increased access to financial literacy workshops, seminars on resume writing, and youth town halls. There was a lot of potential for this type of program to happen because the physical locations of high schools and colleges can serve as sites for career readiness programs and skill training workshops. I fully support this idea, and I'm again calling on DYCD to make this kind of initiative a reality. Just because a young person does not get selected for a summer job opportunity does not mean they cannot learn how to write a cover letter, how to interview for a job, or learn about coding, web design, or graphic design. This program is doable. We just have to think beyond the scope of what has been done in the past and look at what our young people uh, can achieve in the future. In closing, I'd like to say that while this year's summer SYP program is on track to meet uh, pre-COVID enrollment levels, I hope, I would like to see an enrollment of at least 100,000 slots, which will be closer to university's SYP program. At the last budget hearing, Commissioner Chong said DYC would accommodate this number if additional funding became available. If the administration chose to make the funds being used to increase the NYPD's budget and designate them towards DYCD, I'm certain SYP can accommodate 100,000 young people. It's a matter of what administration chooses to prioritize. I look forward to hear how Commissioner Chung's plan to serve our youth this summer, given the proposed allocation of funds from the executive budget. I want to also align myself with the, the chair's request for work, learning, grow. And last, I do want to make sure that every youth program we put forward in DYCD or DOE includes mental health. I want to lift up the 13 year old boy who was found hanging in his home yesterday. Uh, we are all suffering from trauma from the last year. That young boy left a note. He said, goodbye, I love you guys so much, but life is too hard. I don't blame any of you guys. Don't let the school do an assembly about this. These are the people that we need to remember and focus on. Our young people need assistance, just like the, our adults do. So I'm asking everyone in their programming to remember this because hurt people hurt people and sometimes too often they hurt themselves. Violence and suicide is up in New York City. It's up across the nation. I also lift up Jamal Abner, uh, committed suicide when we were younger. I remember as a young man, uh, it always stuck with me. I can't, I need people to think about the amount of pain someone is in to take their lives. Uh, we have a duty here to provide the infrastructure needed to service them. That 13 year old who took his own life is a demonstration of how many different places he was failed. Let's do right by him and so many others who are suffering. Thank you so much. Peace and blessings to you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Public Advocate uh, Williams. That's some really um, a horrible situation that you described uh, yesterday with that young person. Um, okay, let me move on. Um, we have also been joined by um, Minority Leader Mario. Council members Menchaca and Gibson, as well as Council Member Moya. Okay, now we are joined by um, DYCD Commissioner Bill Chong, and I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Rose. My name is Rebecca Chasen, and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. 
please be aware that there can be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Uh, today, we will hear testimony from the Department of Youth and Community Development. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I'll now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses and then call on each of you to so affirm. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Chang? Commissioner, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Haskell. I do. Associate Commissioner Ratray. I do. Assistant Commissioner Scott. I do. Assistant Commissioner Asho. Oh, we may not have audio um, for the Assistant Commissioner. Assistant Commissioner Caldron. I do. Deputy Commissioner Bobbitt. I do. Assistant Commissioner Zhang. I do. Associate Commissioner Fanor. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Mulligan. I do. And uh, Chief Contracting Officer can tell me. I do. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Commissioner Chang, you may begin when ready. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, yeah. Chair Rose, Drum, and, and members of the Committees on Youth Services and Finance and Public Advocate Williams. I am Bill Chang, Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Jadine Fanor, DOICD's Chief Financial Officer, Davida Bailey, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, Dowell Rattray, Associate Commissioner for Youth Services and Strategic Partnerships, Valerie Mulligan, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development, Dan Dana can tell me, our Chief ACO, uh, Mike Bobbitt, the Deputy Commissioner for Youth and Community, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Community Development, and Ron Zhang, Assistant Commissioner for Literacy and Immigrant Services. Uh, we are grateful to have this opportunity to testify on DYCD's fiscal F, uh, 20, 2022 executive budget. As you know, last week, Mayor Bill de Blasio presented the recovery budget for fiscal 2022. This recovery budget is a historic stimulus-driven investment in our comeback and includes a notably high level of funding for DYCD programs. It is aligned with DYCD's mission, which is to alleviate the effects of poverty and to provide opportunities for New Yorkers and communities to flourish by funding an array of critical supports to the city's young people and families. I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Chair Rose and Drum and the entire council and their staff for your steadfast commitment and support of DYCD and the young people and their families we serve. The executive budget includes $835.1 million that will allow DYCD to enhance existing services while launching groundbreaking new initiatives that will help propel New York City's recovery. Last month, Mayor de Blasio announced Summer Rising, a bold vision for summer learning that will be student-centered, experiential, academically rigorous, and culturally responsive. Summer Rising will provide opportunities for young people 
to learn, to get outside and to engage with peers and caring adults in a safe, supervised and enriching robust programs, readying them for a return to school in September. The initiative is, is to try the best, is, 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 is truly the best of both worlds, bringing together for the first time the strengths of DYCD funded summer enrichment initiatives and the Department of Education's academic programs into a singular experience for young people, particularly those from communities hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. K-8 students will be connected to academic classes, enrichment programming, including field trips, arts activities, and outdoor recreation, and will engage in daily social and emotional learning activities. Programs will follow rigorous health and safety protocols, including social distancing, mask wearing, and all uh, locations will have access to testing, nursing support, and a telehealth call center. All K-8 students in New York City are eligible we are pleased that the executive budget includes an additional 44.3 million in DOICD's budget to support this effort, which includes funding for all summer SONIC programs. We appreciate the efforts of School Chancellor Misha Porter and her team on working with us on this exciting new collaboration. Mayor de Blasio announced additional funding for the Summer Youth Employment Program to support 5,000 additional jobs beyond what was previously committed for a total investment of 167 million. SYP has been a rite of passage for New York young people for nearly 60 years. This summer, SYP takes on the added role of bringing back a semblance of normalcy to the lives of 75,000 young people whose lives were upended by COVID-19. The opportunities offered by SYP will go a long way towards helping teens and young adults learn critical skills and map out their futures and become important contributors to the city's recovery. To ensure participant safety <coughs> and needs of employers during the COVID-19 recovery, project-based learning and work-based opportunities may take place in person or uh, on, uh, may take place online, in person, or in a hybrid environment. The executive budget includes uh, 4.35 million to expand Saturday Night Lights this youth development and violence prevention program provides young people with high quality sports and a fitness training. Funded in partnership with our district attorneys and the NYPD, this summer it will expand from 20 to approximately 100 locations. We're also pleased that the executive budget includes 933,000 to launch NYC Unity Works. Starting this summer, the program will uh, be the largest country's largest and most comprehensive workforce development program ever created for LGBTQI communities and will specifically focus on supporting homeless and runaway LGBTQI youth. It arrived during, uh, it, it, it arrived during the ongoing pandemic that uh, exacerbated the challenges LGBTQI young people face connect, in connecting to educational opportunities job training, meaningful work, housing, mental health counseling, and other supports they need to survive and thrive. We thank our partners at the NYC Unity Project, the New York City Center for Youth Employment, the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, and, and Alley Forney Center. The executive budget also supports our ongoing work to support young people and families. I uh, remain grateful and thankful that under Mayor de Blasio, DYC funding has expanded significantly, allowing more New Yorkers to benefit from the programs and services funded by our agency. With the Council's strong support, the de Blasio administration virtually transformed the system for runaway and homeless youth. I recall the day when we only had 253 beds, with many funded by the City Council with discretionary funding, thanks to the efforts of Councilman Luke Fiddler. Since 2014, we have more than tripled the number of residential beds to 813, the last of which came online after the preliminary budget hearing. We increased the age to ser uh, for service eligibility up to 24 and opened additional drop-in centers. There, there are currently eight DYCD funded centers uh, to, uh, to, um, to with at least 24-7 uh, are open in each of, the, with at least one that's 24-7 um, and op opening in each of the five boroughs. Young people have access to high quality mental health services across the portfolio. 
We also transformed our after school for young people. Um, we expanded and enhanced what was known as the out of school time into the successful Compass and Sonic programs. The budget grew from 150.6 million to 381 million and from 563 to about 900 locations. We expanded programming for residents of public housing through the Cornerstone program. We began at 25 locations in 2009 and we now offer services in 99 developments. We grew and enhanced Mayor Dinkins' significant Beacon program to 91 locations and the executive budget includes 1.2 million for additional programming. In support of communities hardest hit by COVID, DYCD issued a request for proposals for anti-poverty programs that will be located in 41 neighborhood development areas across the city. The RFPs in each neighborhood were shaped by surveying residents on what they think their community's greatest needs. These programs will add and will address the needs of older youth, seniors, the working poor, immigrants, and struggling families through education and employment services, literacy services, and assistance to individuals and families in assessing community and social needs. New York, uh, new contracts will commence next year and are part of our overall efforts to help the cities recover. To assist New Yorkers to find these and other programs, DYCD has developed Discover DYCD. It is a digital platform that allows the public to find resources provided by DYCD funded programs, apply for programs, track their applications, and, and reach out to DYCD for assistance by phone, email, or use our digital assistant. It's being used by parents, schools, counselors, and even police officers as the best way to connect young people to resources all on, on a smartphone. Finally, I wanna share with you DYCD's response to the murders of George Floyd, Floyd Brianna Taylor, and Ar Ar Armand Aubrey and others. Last summer, DYCD added to its strategic plan a priority to become a proactive anti-racist city agency. This priority supports CYCD's mission and vision, will help communities recover from the disparate racial impact of COVID-19 and seek to create a systemic change. The rise of anti-Asian violence incidents and violence during the pandemic and additional deaths of un unarmed Black Americans reinforces the importance of anti-racism strategies. DYCD is currently pursuing four anti-racist goals and um, committed to updating uh, or creating other ones in the future. They are uh, researching strategies to, to center equity in DYCD resource allocations, providing anti-racism implicit bias training and resources to DYCD staff, re revising DYCD's equity and mission statements to reflect the agency's current anti-racist position, and increase the pool awareness and hiring of consultants of color who provide support to city organization, to CBO's organizational health operations and program quality. Connect these consultants to SBS to learn how to obtain city MWBE certification if they are, don't already uh, have this designation. Part of these efforts include engaging young people themselves in these important conversations. Beginning last summer, we have sponsored We the Youth, You the People Youth Town Hall series with the goal of supporting young people in the development of a youth agenda to inform policy, practice, and programs that support young people. Youth are talking about upcoming city elections and find, uh, funding priorities uh, of candidates uh, running for office. These and other initiatives are essential in fostering a recovery for all. Uh, thank you again for uh, the chance to testify. And let me say again, um, DUICD wouldn't be where it's at today without the strong support of Chair Rose uh, and Chair Drum, the council members, public advocate Williams. Sometimes uh, uh, the advocacy from the outside uh, helps us on those of us on the inside. So I wanna thank you. In the uh, eight years I have been with DYC as commissioner and in the 16 years that I've uh, had the privilege of working at DYCD, the council has always been a true champion of young people. So thank you again, and I'd be happy to answer your questions now. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your dedicated service as well. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. Uh, let me start off by asking you some questions about Summer Rising. 
Uh, DYCD's executive budget adds over 270 million over fiscal 21, uh, fiscal 21 and 22 in federal stimulus grants with another 55 million in the out years. Of that, 38.7 million will uh, directly fund the newly announced summer rising summer program. How have teachers and principals responded to the summer rising plan? Um, does DOE uh, anticipate challenges getting enough teachers to sign up given the burnout during the pandemic? Okay, well, uh, let me speak and then Susan can address it. I think on the issue of teachers, I think DOE is probably in a better position to answer that question. But uh, as I said in the testimony, Summer Rising really builds on a strong foundation of the summer camps that DYCD has supported for 20 years, if not longer. And I think uh, the very fact that the, the Department of Education reached out to us, I would say in mid-March, and I said to them on the phone at the time, or in the video call, that in my 16 years at DYCD, it, this is the earliest that we've had a conversation with the Department of Education to uh, really plan summer. And we're excited that for the first time, uh, instead of operating on, at, at, at parallel tracks, we're working together to provide uh, a meaningful experience for young people, uh, the things that we can do, they can't do, and the things they can do, we can do. Um, we, the planning has started on a school-by-school -school basis, and maybe uh, Susan can talk a little bit about what she's hearing on the ground. Uh, the 600 programs are already uh, up, have accepted enrollment as of uh, this past Monday, and we're adding programs on a weekly basis. Susan, do you want to chime in? Yeah, that's right, Bill. Um nyc.gov slash summer rising has the uh, programs we've been able to ramp up to date. I think, um, I know DYCD, we're really excited about bringing the strengths of DOE, as the commissioner said, together with DYCD. And I think teachers and principals feel the same. The acknowledgement that every young person um, deserves a bump in this summer in terms of their um, academic uh, ex exposure to academic activities combined with the social emotional skill development that you get from coming into a, an environment with caring adults and able to make new friends and connect with your peers. So overall, um, generally excited, uh, general excitement from both sides, DYCD and DOE. And just in regard to the number of teachers available, do you have any information on that, Deputy Commissioner? No, but we do speak with our colleagues many times a day, and I, I think they feel confident that they're going to be able to staff these programs. Um, so building off their confidence, we're, we're looking forward. Okay, so I, some of the CBOs are worried about, um, uh, the principals have said they're going to have to hire substitute teachers for the program. So that's one of our concerns. Maybe we'll, we will address it as we move forward with the education committee as well. But I just wanted to mention that to you. Um, now, Summer Rising will combine academic and non-academic programs. Uh, given the expansion of services in Summer Rising versus traditional summer school, SYE pro, uh, SYEP providers are concerned about managing hours and securing flexible internship sites should high school summer rising participants be required to attend CBO activities as well as DOE activities? So how flexible will the summer rising attendance expectations be for high school age students? So let me uh, start. And um, first of all, summer rising is primarily uh, K to eight. Um, so that, that's important to understand. Okay. So the, 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 uh, the other programs um, that uh, the, the 190,000 that are expected to be served, we're uh, responsible for up to 100,000 K to eight. The other 90,000 is the responsibility of the Department of Education, and it's a mixture of services which you, they can better explain than I can. Uh, the Summer Youth Employment Program is separate from the Summer Youth uh, Summer Rising. So uh, I'll start, and the Deputy Commissioner uh, Mulligan can uh, chime in. Uh, this year, in, in many ways, we have more flexibility because since we're allowing uh, young people to be either in uh, fully remote internships or hybrid or in-person, it allows a young person who may have to also attend summer school the flexibility to do both. Um, Valerie, you have anything else to add? 
Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. Um, of course, we were working in close partnership with DOE on this, um, making sure that they know what SYEP is going to look like this summer so that they are mindful of it as they're planning their high school summarizing uh, programming. But I would just say, you know, it has been a standard practice of SYEP um, for years to, to work with young people who are also participating in DOE programming. Mm -hmm. Um, so on the SYEP side, we absolutely plan to continue that flexibility. And as the commissioner said this year, the program is going to be even more flexible than it has been in the past by offering remote internships and some unique um, other ideas like micro internships or rotational internships that we are really hopeful will provide that flexibility that our providers and young people are going to need to be able to participate both in the SYEP and DOE programming together this summer. And, and Deputy Commissioner, do you have any numbers in terms of uh, historically how many have participated in both? I don't, but happy to follow up on that with you offline. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and some similar concerns with some of youth employment program. The executive budget adds 13 million for 5,000 additional jobs or a total of 75,000 some of youth employment program participants this year. So given this expansion, how is the CBO community feeling about finding uh, work sites, uh, job placements for all the students who may apply, particularly as businesses are still recovering or may even be shuttered? Uh, what is uh, DYC doing to support providers in finding work sites? So I'll start and then Valerie can add, uh, you know, we're mindful of this. Uh, that's why I think part of it is to give uh, more flexibility. So it doesn't have to be an in-person experience. It could be a remote only experience. And last week I spoke to about, I would say close to 200 employers on a Zoom call. Uh, many of them uh, uh, were minority and women owned businesses that we worked with through Work, Learn and Grow to grow our portfolio of work sites. One of the things that people uh, might not have known is that before the pandemic in 2019, for the first time in the history of the program, the percentage of young people working in the business sector exceeded the nonprofit sector, 44% to 41%. And uh, we're committed to providing young people as many career exploration opportunities as possible. There, when I was in the Summer Youth Employment Program in 1973, the choice you had was work for a nonprofit or work for a government agency. And we know the world of work is much more challenging out there. And a lot of young people who come from under-resourced communities don't know about what's out there. They know what jobs their parents have or their friends' parents have. So one of the big things we've been working on for the last seven years is to really diversify the work experience. And so we will continue to do that with all these obstacles. But um, Valerie, you wanna talk a little bit about what we, what we did yesterday? Yeah, so um, I think I would just say, as the commissioner said, we are well aware that this is going to be one of our biggest challenges this summer. Um, so internally at DYCD, we're really beefing up our efforts to support our providers in terms of employer engagement. So, for example, just yesterday, we did a presentation with Deputy Mayor Thompson to all of our city agency partners, asking them to participate in the SYEP program. The commissioner spoke with uh, the private sector last week. Um, right now, my employer engagement team is presenting to other partners. Um, so we are doing everything we can to leave no stone unturned here. And I also want to highlight that um, we've added additional flexibility here so that we can reach more employers this year. So we have an option where if an employer can't uh, participate in a full 150 hour experience, we're offering things like micro internships and rotational internships so that the program can be more accessible to private employers who want to participate in the program but quit, can't quite make the lift to 150 hours. And then we're gonna um, add a professional training experience on top of that for our young people to create the, the, the full experience. So just to say, we're very mindful of this. We know it's gonna be one of our biggest challenges but we're doing absolutely everything we can to support providers on this front. And if I can, make a, oh, can I make a pitch to ask the council if they could uh, uh, commit to being work sites. Uh, historically, the council has been a big supporter of this program, not only because of your advocacy, but also being work sites. And uh, we'd be happy to host a informational session about how this new model will work with all 51 council members, the public advocates office, whoever wants to host young people, as I said, virtual 
internships, hybrid internships, in-person internships, uh, we want to have, we want to leave no stone unturned when it came, comes to job sites. So I'm kind of putting you guys on the spot, but I hope uh, uh, you, you, you'll meet us and help us with this effort. Well, it was going to be my next question, and actually, uh, just about some of the um, the difficulties that it presents, since our offices mostly are closed. Uh, but if you're saying that we can do, um, you know, uh, virtual uh, job sites and uh, internships, um, uh, perhaps um, you know, uh, research things like that might be appropriate mm -hmm. for them also to do. Um, then I think that um, you know, um, I'm I personally would be. You know, because we always, I always take two or three, maybe four, uh, some youth employment program students um, in the summer, and I would definitely be open to that. So, I'll, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you on on that. And one of the other things that we're actively exploring with the Vaccine Command Center and the Department of Health is what role young people can play in the education and outreach effort around vaccines, because increasingly. Uh, I think among uh, older adults, we've kind of gotten to a good place, but the next challenge will be getting young people vaccinated. So we're hoping to develop some sort of strategy where young people in the summer youth employment program can help uh, be peer educators. I mean, the best messenger to young people is young people. And so since we have an army of young people being paid this summer, they can help us reach their peers to make sure they get the vaccine. So we're thinking, outside the box this summer. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, CUNY has committed to take on 5,000 of the slots. Have they shared if they could assist providers with additional sites that they could take on to support them? Uh, Valerie, I don't know, do you know the answer? Sorry, can you, I'm not <laughs> sure. sure. I follow the <laughs> CUNY is committed to take on uh, 5,000 of the slots. Have they shared if they can assist providers with additional sites? that they could take on to support them. Yeah, um, my understanding is that CUNY is working really hard on their front on worksite development that would be appropriate for their, their 5,000 uh, students. Is CUNY, um, camp, are CUNY campuses open? Would they be virtual? Uh, the, the CUNY positions could be a combination of in-person, virtual or hybrid, depending on what the actual placement is. Okay, the same thing. All right, let me go to uh, community center expansion. The executive budget includes new baseline funding across the plan for community center expansions. Fiscal 21 includes 2.2 million. Fiscal 22 includes 4.4 million with 6.2 million included in the out years. How many more youth and young adult participants does DYCB anticipate reaching in each of the fiscal years uh, with this new funding? So let me uh, have Daryl Rattray, our associate commissioner, who himself is a product of the Beacon program. It was, he was a participant more than 25 years ago when he was much younger. And he, I think it was his, well, one of his many first jobs. So Daryl, you wanna give an update? <laughs> Daryl? Hey Bill, I, I was muted, sorry about that. And yep, Bill, my, the Beacon program was my second SYP job. Cleaning up a vacant lot was my first SYP job, <laughs> my first job <laughs> working in the, in the Bronx. Um, so we do have an allocation for additional community centers. One of them, as folks may know, is a Beacon program at Truman High School. So that RFP was released recently. Um, we are currently uh, reviewing the proposals that came in. Um, so we'll have notice on that relatively soon. Um, in addition, we also received funding for additional cornerstone community centers. So these are NYCHA community centers throughout the city. Um, folks already should already know Marcy Community Center opened up um, last September. Um, we also had Oceanside in Far Rockaway open up. The additional centers, there, there are quite a few on there that need renovations. Um, so we are working with NYCHA uh, to complete those renovations on that timeline um, so we can start our process to actually place a provider at those centers. Some of them, we don't have slot estimates because of the renovations that are happening. Um, it's based on the, the number of classrooms that may be available in that space, the size of the space. Um, so once the renovations are complete or close to completion, 
we can go in, um, do the uh, cost estimates for slots and come up with the larger numbers. So those uh, new places that you mentioned, are those additional providers than what have, who have traditionally provided the program? In the case of Marcy, it was, yes, it was a uh, current provider, which was Grand Street Settlement. Um, and then for Oceanside was the Child Center of New York, which also operates um, the, the community center right next door. So will there be any other uh, additional providers? It's, it's possible. I, I mean, at the point um, that those centers come online, uh, we may be in a position where we're doing an RFP and we're adding those centers onto that RFP. It's all about the timing of those uh, centers being ready um, for occupation, if you will. So just to make, make, put a fine point on this, when we launched this program in, I think, 2009, was it 2009? Yeah, 2009 satellites, the RFP right. was right. 2010. So we, had a, we had a stopgap measure so, so that services could get going immediately. So what we did is we did a satellite program or uh, so you had ran a satellite program if you were the closest, and then we had time to do the request for proposal, and then we opened it up to anyone who was interested. So it was trying to balance the immediacy of getting services off the ground, but also giving us time to do a RFP. In fact, I remember the first 25, when we did the RFP, I think 13 turned over, something like that because it was a shot, it was a stopgap measure to get services off the ground. I assume, and this will probably happen since some of, some of these uh, centers like Mariners Harbor in Staten Island are still under construction. I assume this will uh, happen after I leave, but Daryl will be around to make sure it happens. It's done, it's done right. So commissioner, are you saying that there will be an RFP? At some point in the next two years, uh, uh, particularly for the new sites, uh, because uh, they would, you know, they, there's no, there's no incumbent there. So, but certainly, as new sites become available, uh, we will do RFPs. In the short term, we had to had to do a sort of a, what's called a satellite, an amendment to a nearby cornerstone, just to get services up and running. But uh, you know, we're committed uh, to uh, you know opening up the process. So uh, that will probably happen after I leave. Okay, and will the expansion include additional or augmented programmatic content? Uh, it's, I think, the same model, right, Daryl? Yeah. yeah, right now we're doing the same model, but of course, um, as time goes by, we're assessing those neighborhoods, the, the RFPs as we, we release them. So it's possible, but right now we're looking at the same model, the Cornerstone model. Okay, so what about um, our new uh, centers actually going to be constructed or? or just uh, existing sites being used? Right now, these are all existing sites that may need renovations. So like Gowanus is one of, the, one of them, which is um, receiving renovations with NYCHA. And I, be, I believe DDC is also involved. Do you, anticipate, do you anticipate any new uh, construction sites? No, no, not that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, not that we've discussed so far, no. Okay, because I'm just was asking because then there would be capital budget concerns as well in that regard. No, I think they're all oh. renovations of, of, okay. of sites that were uh, either closed or not used. And is that, are those renovations included in the capital plan? Uh, that's a question I think you have to ask uh, the housing authority. Okay, so it goes through them. Yeah. Okay. All right, just uh, finishing up here, I just want to talk a little bit about adult literacy something that's really important for me and my community, right. especially. In our budget response, the council called for 12 million to be added to the adult literacy program for fiscal 22, but the mayor did not include it in the executive budget. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that language access is critical in workforce development and highly qualified community-based adult literacy programming contributes to the social and civic life of those in need. So what conversations has DYCB had with OMB and the mayor about adding in 12 million for adult literacy supports and how much do you anticipate increasing funding for the adult literacy program? So I'm hopeful that uh, this issue will be resolved as we get to an adopted budget. I've, I've said in the past that I believe core programs, meaning programs that have been funded through multi-year contracts should have stable funding. 
it's the right thing to do for people who go to these places for services. It's the right thing to do for the staff of the nonprofits who run these programs. So we continue to make that case for stable funding. Um, you know, I, when I was at DYCD in the previous administration as a deputy commissioner, I remember something like 40% of the DYCD budget relied on uh, one-year restorations. It's not a way to run quality, impactful programs. So we continue to advocate for it and we appreciate the support that the council and you have had for adult literacy programs because we are a city of immigrants. Um, I know personally that you know, my, my, my parents, when they came to this country in the 1940s, had, didn't have these services. My mother, I tell this story to my staff, because she couldn't read English, when she got, took her job, when she went to work in Chinatown in the garment factory, she would have to count the number of stops to make sure she got off the right station. So I understand on a very personal level how important these programs are and uh, we will continue to advocate and we welcome the support of the council. Well, we look forward to working with you on that. Uh, the speaker and I visited a um, uh, Chinese planning council CPC uh, site um, a couple of years ago, I guess it was. Right. Uh, and we were both emotionally moved by um, uh, uh, the number of people, first of all, that were seeking the services and crowded into the classroom, but also in their struggle and their desire to want to learn English. And, um, you know, it was just so, so vitally important to, the, to these immigrant communities that they get that service. I agree 100%. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Chair Rose, who's going to have some questions. And then I believe um, public advocate, Jamani Williams. Okay, um, thank you, Chair Drum. And um, I, I wanna ask uh, my committee's indulgence. I'm gonna try to get through this round of, the first round of questioning. Um, learning Labs, um, when we last left off at DYCD's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget hearing with some outstanding questions also pertain to the executive budget. Learning Labs have been fully funded for one year now with a total of $1.71.5 million for fiscal year 21 programming, of which 68.6 .6 million was added in the executive budget. How many actual K through eight grade students are currently participating or enrolled in Learning Labs? And how many total slots are available for K through eight grade participants? So I'm going to ask Susan or Daryl to see if they can give an update, or if not, we can get back to you. Susan? Thanks, oh. Chair. Um, yeah, we uh, ultimately, we ended up funding uh, roughly 18,000 uh, learning lab seats with capacity to serve as many as 36,000 young people. I think the last um, data that we polled that we had shared with council was that roughly 13,000 young people were enrolled in, in those programs. Um, and so uh, how many slots are still available then? Uh, that, let's see. I, I mean, uh, the one complication I just wanna put in here is that over the course of the school year, the way young people participate in the program has changed. In other words, let's say when middle schools went down, you might have had a young person attending five days a week, which is different than the way we ramped up thinking that a single seat could serve as many as two young people. So there have been variations in capacity through the year, throughout the year, um, but we funded, as I said, roughly 18,119 seats. Um, I mentioned we had uh, the, over the course of the year about 13,000 enrolled. So that, that was a, an additional capacity of about 5,000 seats to serve probably more than that, um, assuming a young person wasn't coming all five days, but that, that there was some uncertainty around that. In, individual, individ, individual, individuals could participate as many days as they needed to based on capacity at their site. With more students returning to five days a week in, personal, in, in person learning at their schools, um, that, that's a decrease in participation rates in learning bridges um, and lab programs. Um, will these decreasing rates of participation impact the providers' contracts? Uh, I can say no. I mean, 
we knew that when we designed the Learning Bridge program, it was a transition program. And we were dealing with literally a moving target as far as the opening and closing of schools. Some schools were able to do five days of in-person, other schools did two days in person. And so um, it wasn't, it was kind of messy and we understood that going in that it was gonna be not a perfect situation. And so we knew that the providers were doing the best they could under a constantly changing environment, uh, both from a health perspective and also from the opening and closing of schools and capacity. So, uh, you know, we, we, we will not, you know, uh, there won't be any contract implications. The program will end uh, this fiscal year. And, you know, when we go back to full-time uh, school, uh, this, this, this program won't be needed anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, summarizing, um, the executive budget adds 38.7 million for summarizing. As discussed in our preliminary budget hearing, there was funding in the budget for Compass, Beacon, and Cornerstone camp slots. The executive budget restored 5.7 million for Summersonic program slots. What percentage will be used in center base at Cornerstones, not summarizing affiliated Summersonic programs? I'm not sure if Susan can answer that or, uh, well, let's start with Susan and and, and Daryl, I think most of the sonic restoration was for the school sonic programs that only operated during the school year. So I'm not sure if there was any money added to cornerstones or beacons, but Susan or Daryl can correct me if I'm wrong. That's, that's right. The, um, the sonic, uh, the baseline sonic programs, uh, middle school programs that have summer services throughout the year and they were, um, the funding for the summer was not included in the preliminary budget, but was, it was restored, that 5.7 million. That includes school-based programs and center-based programs. So all of the Sonic programs that had baseline summer programs got restorations this year. It's our plan that the additional middle school seats will most likely be school-based. Um, we're, you know, we're assessing demand at the summarizing programs, but at this time we're planning to allocate additional middle school seats to school-based summarizing programs. I don't um, know if um, Jadine or Daryl want, want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that, I think that's our plan at this, at this time. Okay. Um, so all of these program budgets will now be combined under summer rising? I, the, the same contracts, I think the summer rising was more um, a way to like uh, make clear that the partnership between the Department of Education and DYCD was, was much more integrated than it had ever been. But the, the, we're not renaming Sonic, we're not renaming Compass, it's just Compass and Sonic programs are part of this larger initiative called Summer Rising. So the contracts pretty much stay the same. It's, I guess, more from a, how do we publicize it to the general public? So what is the total funding for Summer Rising that's included in DYCD's budget um, for Compass contracts for, um, for what are, what will the total budget for Compass contracts for some of camps what will the total budget for Sonic contracts be for summer camps? And what will the total budget for Beacon contracts be for summer camps? I think Jadine- so I'll take that. Has this. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon, Chair Rose, how are you? Um, so as Susan indicated before, for the base contracts, which included Compass, Beacon, Cornerstone, um, which is approximately about 58,000 slots. We had about 41.6 million um, in totality for that. Then we have the um, 8,564 that was restored, which was 5.7 million. Um, and then we also had the um, summarizing, which you guys stated was about 38.7 million. So all told, we are um, assuming $85.9 million um, contributing to summarizing. 
Um, are the cornerstone contracts also included in summarizing? So in the base portion, so, so Susan is shaking her head no, but um, just, she's correct, but I, nothing was added for cornerstones. And like she said, those are going to be school-based. We are focusing on school-based um, programming. So will um, uh, the Cornerstone summer programs be supported by new community center funding that's included in the budget? And if so, how much? So Daryl, you wanna jump in on that? I'm not sure I'm understanding. Yeah, Chair Rose, can you repeat that question? Yeah. Let, me, let me try to tease it out. Are Cornerstone summer programs being supported by any of the new community center funding included in the budget? And if so, how much additional funding is being allocated specifically for summer expansion in Cornerstones this summer? So I'll, I'll try to answer, and Jadine, you should listen to everything I'm saying right now directly. <laughs> I will. Um, so they're not getting additional funding. The, the funding that's allocated in the budget is for any brand new, well, let me modify brand new, any centers that open up after the renovations. Correct. Um, so there's no additional summer funding. They're using their um, full base budget for their summer programming as, as they would do um, any other year. That's correct. So, um, so the new community center funding is, is included in the budget, in the, the overall cornerstone budget? Not that, this. I, I, that's correct. And that's for the centers. They, again, they're not coming online right now because the renovations are still occurring, but we can get, we can work with NYCHA to get you a timeline of when those new sites will come on. Okay. I think the only center that's opening that didn't open last year is the Marcy site in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, Marcy opened up September, 2020. Right, so that's the only new center that will be operating this summer all the other new funding for Cornerstones won't happen this summer because the renovations are still underway. But it's the money is in our budget, I guess, right? So, yeah. So the answer is there is no new additional funding being allocated specifically for summer expansion in the Cornerstones. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. How much funding was just added to DOE's budget for summer rising? That's something you'd have to get from DOE. We're not privy to that information. Okay. And what is the target enrollment for summarizing? Well, the target at this point is up to 100,000. And you know we want to be flexible because uh, we start with about 60,000 already in baseline programs, but we understand the demand will vary from neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, you know, this will be a, a learning experience for us to see how parents will respond. Some, you know, some programs I understand are getting great responses. And so I think it's a neighborhood by neighborhood strategy, but we wanna build flexibility into the system. So we hope to uh, serve up to 100,000 young people uh, K through eight. And so um, uh, just for clarification, um, Basically, the cornerstones are being left out of the summer rising program. It's separate. The summer rising program is basically a school based strategy focusing on school based uh, uh, existing summer camps and additional new programs that might get added if there's not a, a, a program in a particular building, but it's mostly school based, whereas the uh, cornerstone is, as you know, uh, based in public housing. And, you know, they're being restored to where they were in 2019. If you recall last year, we eliminated evening hours. There were no evening hours last year. Uh, it was a bare bones uh, situation. We're going back in time to 2019. We're operating evening hours and then I think, guess on weekends as well. Right, Daryl? That's correct. Seven days a week to 11 p.m. in the summer. Right. Um, will that affect um, the, their contracts if less people enroll are enrolling? I, typically, and you know, Susan or Daryl can chime in, we understand summer is always a challenging time. And so generally we don't necessarily look at 
attendance has in the same level as we did in the school year, where you have a longer time period where you're engaging young people. And this summer, obviously, with um, the challenges of, of still around with the pandemic, uh, we're going to be mindful of you know giving people flexibility. We know people are trying yeah, their best. That's going to impact the enrollment of you know the cornerstones um, and you know. Um, have as more people, if more people enroll in summer rising, then uh, it takes away from, you know, the cornerstone programs. And we wouldn't want that to impact, you know, their enrollment numbers. No, I mean, we're going to be flexible. Program. I mean, throughout this pandemic, we've been extremely flexible in how we evaluate programs, because we know that things happen beyond their control. Okay. Thank you. Um, the applications uh, for summarizing uh, opened on Monday, 426. Um, how many applications have been received? And um, how do these numbers compare to the CBO capacity as reported through DYCD survey? I think Susan has an updated number. Susan? Yeah, sorry, Bill. I was just waiting to unmute. Uh, I think as of today, we have applications from 20,000 unique participants. And um, at this time, you can only uh, actually apply to the programs that are available. As Bill said, um, nearly 600 programs. We still have hundreds of programs that will come online in the next week and two. And that will, well, that will bring more applicants to the to the process. Currently, we have uh, 20,000 applicants in just, you know, in that past week. Okay. And how did these numbers compare to the CEO's capacity? Well, we have, um, you, you know, we have, again, 20,000 applications. We have, uh, roughly speaking, I don't have this exact number, but maybe 60,000 seats available in those programs that are up right now. And as the commissioner mentioned, we're, we have, we're planning to go up to 100,000. So at this time, um, you know, we're, we're, we welcome people to apply. Okay, great. Summarizing is being pitched as an end of summer school as we know it. However, DYCD contractors have been informed that they will receive the same rates they have in the past. What is the justification for level funding to CBOs given the increased programming requirements for 2021? Student staff ratios have shifted significantly as programs have implemented new procedures to protect from the spread of COVID-19, making programs more expensive. What have the conversations been in terms of using this model for next year? Well, hopefully next year we'll be in a very different place. So we, um, the additional expenses uh, and some are rising or more on the DOE side because they're bringing teachers into the program. And so the basic model, and that's why I think, you know, it's a little misleading. Some are rising is essentially for, from a DYC perspective, the usual summer camp experience. The big difference is teachers will be working with the CBO staff to provide additional services, which the teacher, the cost of teachers will be covered by the Department of Education. We're not expecting the nonprofits to pay the cost of teachers. Uh, that that total cost will be. I understand that this this, this the uh, staff the staff ratios have not changed to my knowledge. And Susan and, and Daryl can tell me the state. The only change uh, from the state's perspective, and we're waiting for more guidance, is things like mask wearing, social distancing, things like that. So it's the same one to uh, 10, I think, for middle school and one to 15 for elementary school. Uh, don't quote me on that, Susan and Daryl can, but is that true, Daryl? The, the staffing ratios haven't changed, right? Yeah, and it'll be one to 10 elementary school, one to 15 middle school. The, the only change is the maximum number of people we can have in a classroom. And right now we're still capped at 15. Okay. And, um, and we've made allowances for COVID procedures um, so that the CBOs are not um, absorbing those costs, right? We've, provide, we've distributed millions of dollars 
in uh, millions of uh, PPEs over the course of this pandemic. And a lot of the services I mentioned in my, uh, the testing and uh, the telehealth uh, portal is all provided uh, by the city. And we're not asking any nonprofit to, to support those costs. Okay. Um, with SYEP CUNY, fiscal year 2022 executive budget adds approximately $13 million in a one-time funding, which adds five SYEP CUNY slots this summer. Are there talks to add even more slots at adoption, which we encourage? Um, are there are these 5,000 slots open for all CUNY community college students or just CUNY NYCHA residents? Uh, let me start and then uh, Valerie can um, add on about CUNY. I'm not aware of any plan to add additional jobs. I think one of the concerns, and I'm sure you've heard this yourselves, is the nonprofit community is concerned about their capacity to serve um, more young people given the challenges of the pandemic. And that's why we've made it very clear from the outset, as far as those work sites, to give people flexibility, remote, in-person and hybrid, because we understand uh, unlike you know, 2019, where we were able to get a lot of local businesses to be work sites, the situation has changed dramatically. So that is one concern I think that we have heard loud and clear from our nonprofit partners is about what their capacity is to take on more jobs. Uh, Matt Fowler, you wanna talk about CUNY? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question. Just to answer the second half of your question in terms of how CUNY is targeting their slots. Um, they are really focused on CUNY students who are NYCHA residents, those who are in zip codes that are most impacted by COVID. Um, so those are their first two priority groups. And then they're also reaching out to other high-risk groups like young people who are in or have been in foster care, those who are homeless or at risk of being homeless, um, those receiving cash assistance. So the CUNY slots are really being targeted towards um, the students in CUNY who need the, the resources the most. Are there specific numbers targeted for each of these subsets? No, they're just doing specific targeted outreach across the board to uh, all CUNY students who are NYCHA residents, all CUNY students who are uh, identified as living in one of those zip codes. Um, okay. Clearly these slots will only be for the older youth uh, subset and no younger youth will be included. So all the, the SYEP CUNY participants will be earning wages rather than a stipend. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Since the SYAP application closed on April 30th, and this budget was just released on April 26th, did those CUNY students only have one week or five days to apply? And what was or what will be the application process? No, so we have extended the application specifically for CUNY students through May 16th. Um, so they will have adequate time to, to apply. And I will also add CUNY has been ready to go with this cohort. So we already have over 4,800 applications in the system for these 5,000 slots. Um, so we're looking really good in terms of reaching the young people we're looking for in that cohort. Can you tell us how many applications DYCD has received for the SYEP to date? And how many applications were for the um, younger youth slots? and how many applications were for the older youth slots? Yes, so across the system, we have approximately 150,000 applications. Um, let me see if I have the breakdown of older youth and younger youth. If not, I can get it to you offline. It might take me a minute to do the quick math. <laughs> okay, and um, uh, do you have a breakdown of of which ones were older youth and which ones were younger youth? Let me do the math, I'll get it, I'll get back to you. Oh, oh okay, okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Um, uh, if, if we have, you, you can see the demand is great uh, and we, we're only talking about 75 total SYEP slots and you already have 150,000 applications. Are we working toward, um, are, are we recommending 
an increase to the number of slots for SYEP and, um, and how are we working toward universal SYEP? So as I said, I think for this year, I think there, there's been no discussion about adding additional beyond the 75,000 because we've heard loud and clear from our nonprofit partners, they're concerned about their ability to serve more than 75,000. For the future, I think that's a question that the next administration is gonna to have to look at closely, how to grow the, the system beyond 75,000 and how do you bring on more providers? Because to grow a system, you need more programs. Because I think uh, even, even before the pandemic, uh, I think you know, we were maxing out on the ability of our nonprofit partners to serve uh, the number of young people they were. The other factor, which may not be a factor this, this year, but historically before the pandemic, uh, to fill a summer youth employment job, we had to make one and a half offers, meaning the summer 2019, that's the only number I have to work with. I think to fill the 75,000 jobs that year, we had to make something like 125 or 30,000 offers. Now that was in good times. These are not good times economically. So whether that holds true this year remains to be seen because in the past, what we found is that young people would turn down a job for whatever reason. They didn't like it. They found another job. One of the th things about the history of summer youth employment program that I don't think people really appreciate is when we went online to do a, a digital application in 2005, we made it easier for people to apply. I remember when I applied, and this is as recent as 2004, the city printed a finite of carbon copy applications. Carbon, in fact, Daryl, when he was in the summer youth employment program probably had to fill out a carbon copy application and there was a finite number. So there was almost like the city had this artificial cap on the number of applications. By going digital, we made it easier for more people to apply. And so that's a good thing because it's easier to apply for services. But then we saw this drop off over the last three pandemic years where young people would apply and then not follow through or turn down an offer. So I'm not sure what this summer will be like. So that's something we're gonna learn because obviously the kind of jobs that a young person would normally get aren't there anymore. So there might be a less of a drop off this year. So, uh, but that, you know, I'm sorry for the long winded answer but it's a lot of um, nuances to this issue. How many offers will you make this year? We'll, we'll make 75,000 offers, but then again, if a, if a young person says no, we then have to then make another offer. That, that's the point. Then in the past, there has been a drop off and we had to make more offers than we had uh, to, to, to get to 75,000 jobs. I'm not sure that's gonna be true this year because this is a very different year, but uh, that was the case up until 20, I mean, up to 2019, where I think that that year it really was a startling that we had to make something like 130,000 offers to fill 75,000 jobs. And then last year was very different, as you know, because it was a, a different model altogether. So, um, but I, you know, I think the potential for growth is there. We need to grow the system. Uh, I'm heartened that in, in, the, in some of the campaign advertising I've seen among the people running for mayor, they're all talking about DYCD programs. One person's talking about in, uh, increasing the number of summer jobs to 150,000 over four years. Other people are talking about universal after school. It, I hope it happens. Okay. Could you email Michelle and I the updated uh, data today so that we can review all of the applications received detailing all the special initiative, you know, subsets? Um, yeah. Valerie will follow up. Valerie, were you able to, to sort of parse that out? Or? Yeah, so, um, so we have 150,000 applications across the system. Um, so for younger youth, it's 35,600 applications. For older youth, it's 114,200 applications, roughly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you, can, you can send us, you know, the, the more specific data, okay? Absolutely. Thank you.
Um, as as I, I mentioned in my opening statement, um, Work, Learn, Grow was, uh, was one of the programs that were not um, funded in the, um, in the budget. So uh, the CUNY model um, of fiscal year 2022 will represent the seventh year of the council's year round youth employment initiative, Work, Learn, Grow. Year after year, the demand is steady and the program receives an average of approximately 15,000 applicants, not including last year as, um, as was, you know, as the pandemic and, and the program was budgeted for far fewer slots accordingly. The council called on the administration to baseline work, learn, grow in its fiscal 2022 budget response. Why was Work, Learn, Grow not included in the executive budget? So let me say that uh, we appreciate the partnership we've had with the council uh, in developing this program. It's gotten better every year. I am confident that in the budget negotiations towards an adopted, this issue will get resolved. Um, it's, you know, it's a program that we recognize the value of it. That's why we brought CUNY in as a partner th this year. And the other benefit this year that we hope to continue and that we're actually building on for the Summer Youth Employment Program is for the first time we've engaged in a very robust way, minority and women owned businesses that provided a lot of the work experience for young people and work, learn and grow. So I am confident that as you sit down with the administration and work on an adopted budget, this issue will be resolved. And let me just say, uh, give you some context and history of how we came up with the name because I don't think many people know how we came up with the name. Uh, it's, it's, we adapted a quote from Richard Murphy, uh, the, the first commissioner of the Department of Youth Services. Mm -hmm. And actually it's on a plaque in, a, in the room that we dedicated in his honor at uh, our offices. And he talked about the role of, D, of Department of Youth Services and of government was to create small universes for young people to learn and grow. And that resonated with me. So I know it's kind of a long-winded name. It doesn't have an easy acronym like Compass or Sonic or whatever, but it really speaks to what our commitment is. It's about having young people learn and grow and creating those universes. And the work experience is a big part of that learn and grow experience. So, but I am confident it's, it's, it's such a successful program with the council support that this hopefully will get resolved in the adopted budget. I hope so too. Um, it's an it's a excellent mission for um, DYCD. And so, um, you know, it, it remains important to us. Uh, so what have the conversations been around baselining work, learn, grow? We know DYCD appreciates this program as you rolled it out, uh, as you rolled out a new model, which incorporated one CUNY credit for a portion of programming. Would you consider that model a success even being rolled out during the pandemic? Well, let me answer your first question and then uh, Valerie can answer the second question. You know, if it was up to me, I would baseline it. But as you know, this, is, this budget process is um, much more complicated and requ requires a much more uh, engaging process with OMB and the mayor who will have obviously the final say, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a smashing success, a great partnership. So if, if I had the only vote, I would baseline it, but you know, it's a process that hopefully the council will engage the administration and we can make the case to baseline it. Val, you want to talk but about the- You are making the effort, but you are making the efforts. Yes, I mean, they know my position. I've said, wherever we can baseline, something that has a multi-year program. And the Work, Learn, and Grow is a component of the Summer Youth Employment Program. So it, it's, you know, an SYP is a multi-year initiative. So it, it kind of makes uh, it challenging to do it year to year. Uh, to the extent we can baseline it, if it was up to me, I would certainly do it. And I, 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 I'm hopeful that in the budget negotiations, uh, this can, issue can be resolved. Um, Val, you wanna talk about the CUNY uh, experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I 
I want to add that I think across the board, this year's model in particular was really successful. We've done a lot of gathering feedback from participants, from employers, from providers. I think everybody was really thrilled with how it rolled out. So if we are funded for Work, Learn, Grow again, um, we would definitely look to continue this model. I think we really made strides this year in terms of leveraging that career-ready school-based framework um, and adding the academic component through CUNY, the career readiness training through our providers, and then that real work experience. So um, really appreciate your partnership on this one and think it's an amazing model and, and definitely looking forward to continuing it. Can you tell me what the single cost, uh, what the cost for a single work, learn, grow participant is under the new hybrid CUNY model? Um, and uh, how many students can be supported by the $20 million exactly? Yeah, so I think um, the $20 million can support approximately 4,700 uh, work, learn, go experiences. Jadine, please correct me if I'm wrong. And then I'm looking for the cost per participant right now. We can get you that information offline as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then could you also um, uh, get me the, um, the course for a single work, learn, grow participant under the, you know, the traditional work, learn model, work, learn, grow model um, that was adjusted for um, the 2022 course. So last year's program versus yeah, this year's program. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And under the, um, um, while DYCD is committed to work with mm -hmm. um, staff, um, my office directly, um, and my office to directly cost this together as negotiations proceed, will, uh, will you be willing to work together with uh, council staff and, and my office to, um, to, uh, to get the direct costs for this? negotiation. Never I mean, mind. we'll work with OMB to make sure you have whatever you need. Okay. All right. Okay. That's, I, I just want to make sure that there's a smooth process right. and that, you know, we achieve our ultimate goal. Um, sometimes we don't get the, the figures that we ask for in a timely manner. Um, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to um, uh, I guess the public advocate or committee members, um, and I'll I'll save the rest of my questions for a second round, Chair Drum. Okay, we're going to go back to Council actually, who has some some questions from Council members. All right. Okay. So, if any Council members have questions, um, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and you'll be added to the queue. And as a reminder, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. And we will now hear from Council Member Grudenchik, followed by Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. I don't plan on using all my five minutes. Uh, I don't usually get to, once a year, I get to meet with the Youth Committee um, because of uh, I'm on the Finance Committee. And I, I really do want to thank um, Commissioner Chong, who I've known for quite some time. Uh, we used to run into each other on William Street back in the good old days. <laughs> Um, many years ago. I want to thank you for your service to the to the people, especially the young people of the city. Commissioner Chong, I, I just want to, um, assuming you're not commissioner next term, but you know what, maybe somebody will be smart and they'll continue you on as a commissioner mm -hmm. or perhaps in another position. We, we won't speculate. One of the things that, um, that I, I hope will be accomplished by the city one day soon, um, after school care is so hit or miss, um, some of my schools, very few of them have compass mm -hmm. programs. Um, I had asked for a number and uh, somebody on council finance a few years ago told me it would be about $200 million. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that. I, I, I want to put it in your head. Maybe you'll make a letter to whoever succeeds you. Um, that this is so important because, uh, you know, when I was very young in the city, uh, most mothers didn't work um, or they worked mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. Uh, the world has obviously changed. Um, um, most families, both parents work. And, you know, for a community like mine here in Eastern Queens, um, where most people don't work in the community, um, it's mostly a bedroom community, with the exception of LIJ and Danny Drum's dog. 
Um, <laughs> Um, it, it is hard to get, you know, and schools don't close at three o'clock anymore. They close at two right. or two twenty. So I just want to put that in your head. I know you've thought about it, um, but I think it would be an outstanding investment. Um, I love our beacon programs. I love um, anything that engages young people. And I, I still believe that the amount of money we're spending on our youth uh, in three year agency is seriously not enough, even though we have made strides forward. Um, but after school programming would be wonderful. I, I know how much parents want it because I, uh, one of the things that I'm most complimented on are CASA programs, which um, we have 15 of them now. I, I could use one. I have a, a lot more schools than 15, but it, it's just the sense that um, there isn't enough for kids to do after school. And um, I, I think they really need to be you know, supervised, as, especially the younger they are, and, and even older kids, too. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. And I'm going to return my time um, back to the chairs. Um, I thank you again, Bill, and um, look forward to seeing uh, what we'll both be doing in the next chapters of our lives. If I could just make a, a brief comment that, um, you know, I agree that, you know, if, if we had the resources, I know there were many more schools that we could have compass program that. Um, it's certainly one of the things that I've, I've been putting on my running list to include in my transition memo to my successor um, because, um, and I, I'm heartened by seeing, again, the campaign ads for different elect, uh, people running for mayor and people are calling about expanding after school and having it available to any young person who wanted it. And we understand the benefits of after school. Unfortunately, uh, we've never had, and this goes back to the Bloomberg administration, ever had enough resources to have an after-school program in every school. Uh, we were able to do it with Sonic. And so I believe uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And hopefully this is something uh, my successor can success successfully uh, get done. I'm sending you a highlighter so you can highlight in the memo. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Thank you Barry. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Thank you to both Chair Jong and Chair Rose for your advocacy for our youth. And Commissioner Chung, <laughs> you and I go way back. And I just wanted to tell you how proud I am um, to see you as the Commissioner uh, for the youth and also your work in the past. And I remember during the Bloomberg administration, all we did was fight to restore the cuts year after year. And in this de Blasio administration, at least we were able to expand uh, some of the critical programs like SYEP and, and Best for you know, Homeless and Runaway Youth. Um, those were the those are, will be the legacy for this administration and, and for this council. Um, I also wanted to, um, Right away, what my colleague just said earlier about you know after school program, and I think it's just so critical, and it's good that we hear this whole summer rising program. And my question, um, thank you also to your team uh, for all the great work during this past you know eight years. And this is our last budget, and let's make it a, a really strong uh, budget uh, for the youth and for their families and especially for immigrant youth. Um, so my question with the summer rising and Compass and Sonic, especially with, for the younger kids, because in many of the schools, the, the program is not gonna be offered in every school and they have to sign up and the signing up is going online and we have parents that don't know how to use computers or don't have computers. And also in my district, I also have schools where the caregivers are grandparents. So they, yeah, they want programs for the kids, but they don't know how to sign up. And because it's not in every school, it makes it more difficult. So how are the like, is there a way to sort of coordinate, um, you know, with DYCD um, provider who are providing summer Sonic or, or summer, Compass program to work with the school to get the parents registered for summer rising. Are there coordination, you know, between this these programs? 
So let me start, and Susan might have more details. It's my understanding that um, a lot of programs are, have reach, are reaching out directly to, to uh, young people and their parents who have been previously enrolled. So we want to make sure that people who've been in the program have an opportunity to apply and they can, I'm not sure how that's being done. So uh, we're not putting all our eggs in the uh, one basket and saying you have to go through the Discover DYCD app because we recognize the digital divide. So people are proactively reaching out to uh, uh, families already enrolled in the program because they know that these parents have already shown an interest. So I know Susan or Darrell, if you have you know, other things, can people still apply in person? Susan or Daryl? Hello? Can somebody unmute them for us? Oh. Okay. You're not muted, sir. Oh, what? No, no. This, oh, no. Susan is not. Yes. Test Susan? Okay. All right. Yeah. So yeah, so um, commissioner, correct. Uh, people can still apply on person. Um, providers are working with the principals that they're connected to um, to ensure that there's no, hopefully no gaps in enrollment. Are, are, are you able to open up new sites? Like if one of the schools in my district is not a dedicated site for summer rising, but they do have a DOICD program in there. Is there a way to open up that site so, for summer rising? So right now we're, we're working with DOE. We do have a number of schools that have been identified for a number of factors. Um, I would have, you know, if, if there's a site that hasn't been identified for summer rising, we would have to um, speak with DOE to ensure that that's a site that can open. Yeah, because some of the other sites that are open, they're over right. capacity. So parents right. can't, you know, not willing to, I mean, they can't get the, the space. They can't get the slot. So, because um, there'll be definitely a lot of interest uh, for parents to apply because it's like a summer, it's like summer camp. And that's why every year we fought to increase, you know, co uh, okay. compass. So if summer rising is available, parents are gonna want that program, but not every school has it. So that's gonna be a, a difficult situation. So the two things that are gonna happen between now and the start of the program, one is uh, we're gonna, uh, we have about 600 existing programs that have baseline funding. And so we're gonna, the Department of Education is doing this thing called affiliation, where I think there are six to seven hundred six to seven hundred school buildings that are open, and a lot of buildings are not open. So every young person in a K to A school, their summer services will be at an affiliated school building. We're going to work with DOE and Susan and Daryl can correct me and do an assessment building by building to see what the demand is and if we need to amend the contracts to add additional seats to that site. Some buildings may not have a program. In that situation, uh, we will do what's called a satellite program. We'll look at what, what the closest compass or sonic program might be to that building and ask them to do a satellite program at that building. So the goal is every school building uh, that is open will have a program and that buildings that have programs and need additional seats will get additional seats. That's why we said, a minimum of 60,000 up to 100,000. That's, we've been given the authority to do that. Uh, Susan, Darrell, did I misstate anything? Okay. That, that was perfect. Okay, that's good to hear. So hopefully every kid who needs it will get one. Thank and you. So we encourage people to check uh, the website for those who have um, uh, access to technology because programs are literally coming on every Monday. Because the, the DOE process takes time and, you know, it's, it's driven by them. So I can't tell them hurry up, you know, because they have to, you know, it's a little bit like the dating game, I guess, right? So they have to figure out which schools are working together. And then once they tell us, then we'll do the assessment and see more seats or a satellite program. Well, you need to push DOE because they, they need to inform their principal. Uh, otherwise, problem will happen and then we get the calls and say, you know, what are we gonna do with our kids who needs the program? Uh, so you guys, DYCD should take the lead and just push DOE. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, we now have questions from Council Member Menchaca. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chairs Rose, Drum, and so good to be here with the rest of the committee members uh, and Commissioner Chong. Really great to be uh, here talking with you about some really important things with your team. And so my, uh, actually, before I ask my question, I, I also just want to lift up some of the questions around adult literacy that uh, Councilmember Drum brought out. Uh, really, in so many ways, I think the partnership was real, but the partnership was really led by the council. And uh, and I definitely remember that time when we went to CPC and I really just spoke directly to some of the students and how, how important that is today. And, and having spent a lot of time this just this last a few months inside of adult literacy classes, we have really seen the power of the Zoom element really allow for more families to come in. And I think we're just gonna have more waiting lists and also a transformation of access to those adult literacy classes. And so I'm really excited, excited to, to keep talking about that, adult literacy uh, and some of the language access issues. Which brings me to the question. I am a big supporter of language banks and the power that they have brought to other cities. Uh, Commissioner, have you spoken to OMB about that project? This is something that this is not new to you too because the council has pushed this in the past. It, it's landed in our budget responses. And so uh, I, I really just wanna focus on that and whether or not that's on the table for you all, where is it in conversation? Uh, and you should know that I'm talking with the Department of Health and other folks that are, that are connecting to federal dollars that are coming to, the, to cities across the country around uh, vaccine equity and really building out this infrastructure, cooperatives where... Hello? He froze. Carlos, we lost you. Councilmember Menchaca? Yep. Okay. We didn't hear the end of your statement. Oh, I just wanted to see if you can give us an update about where the language bank conversations are with OMB. I don't, I'm not aware of anything we're directly involved with. Uh, it might be another uh, city agency that's leading the effort on language banks. Um, you know, I, you know, as the son of immigrants, I firmly believe the easier we, we make it for people to gain services, uh, the better. So, um, but it's not part of uh, DYCD's uh, portfolio at this point. Uh, but, you know, sometimes things get added at the last minute. Um, so uh, it sounds like something that makes a lot of sense in a city which is overwhelming immigrants or the uh, children of immigrants to, to make it easier to access government. That's certainly been one of the things I focused on from day one is how to make it easier for people to apply, not just for literacy programs, but for after school. Uh, because, you know, we have, we're, we're siloed government and DYCD is a siloed government. We had 40 different programs. And if you wanted to apply for three different programs, you had to go to three different places. So I'm yeah. all for access, uh, but the language, uh, Bank is not something that's uh, certainly been on my radar. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure who OMB is talking to about that. Okay. Well, I, I think that maybe the last thing in the last minute, you you brought up earlier, we're going to take you up on the offer to bring more, uh, and we do every year, SYEP folks to the, the office. But I also wanted to kind of engage you on the conversation around the kind of COVID response and mm -hmm. what young people are gonna be potentially doing uh, through SYEP. Can you give us a little bit more about who you're working with? Uh, what other agencies are connecting to this? How far are you in, into this? Are you bringing in providers? Just give us a sense about how real this is. So we're doing two things. One is we're working with city agencies uh, through the Vaccine Command Center and the Department of Health and the Health and Hospitals Corporation to see what kind of jobs and work experiences young people can uh, be part of this summer. And then also we're looking at the nonprofits that have been pop-up vaccine sites or done outreach work to see whether they would be willing to take on young people. Um, as I said earlier that, you know, uh, I think the best messenger to young people is young people. I mean, that was clearly the message in these uh, youth town halls that we've been doing right. uh, since the pandemic that uh, we have 
routinely over a thousand young people logging on because it's led by young people. So yep. I think if you can carve out a role for young people uh, either to, uh, to be on the ground to do like logistical support at vaccine sites to just check people in or to be out on the streets talking to their uh, peers about the importance of getting a vaccine. Because if you've seen the recent uh, news reports, we're hitting a ceiling as far as vac vaccination. Yeah. And I think the uncharted territory to get to herd immunity or as close to herd immunity as possible is young people. Can you connect me to the person and team that's working on this? I'd love to learn more. Well, Valerie is working uh, as the deputy commissioner who's in charge of the of Workforce Connect. And so she's the one who's coordinating with other city agencies. Sweet, I'll, I'll connect with Valerie later. Thank you so much, chairs. I believe now we're gonna go back to count to Chair Rose. Chair Rose, and we'll wrap it up with her questions. Okay. Thank you so much. And in the interest of time, I know we've run over. Um, I'm going, I'm not going to ask all of my questions. I'll submit them. Um, but I, I did want to ask about the indirect cost um, initiative goal. Um, the fiscal 2022 executive budget adds 12.8 million in fiscal 2021 into the out years to support DYCD funded indirect contracting costs. Last year, the fiscal 2021 executive plan had cut 1.4 million in fiscal 2020 and the fiscal 2021 adopted plan cut 1.4 million in fiscal 2022 and the out years. This funding, this funding more than restores these cuts to support providers. Could you just tell us how many contracts and providers is the indirect rate funding supports within DYCD's portfolio? I think Jajin has been following this. So you wanna chime in, Jajin? Jajin? You're muted. Hi, sorry, okay, I finally got my pop-up to unmute. Um, there's approximately 1,100 contracts we, on, we anticipate it impacting. Oh. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the fiscal 2020 budget currently baselines 1.5 million to fully fund the existing 60 RHY beds for 21 to 24 year old homeless youth. Um, during our recent youth uh, count hearing, no one mentioned that this funding was coming online for these supports. And does DYCD have the results from the youth count ready to share yet? I don't think so, because usually they take uh, a while to do it. And so uh, either Susan or Randy Scott can give me an update since if there's any update since the hearing on youth count. Randy? Not muted. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, I had to wait for it to be unmuted. With respect to the youth count, um, we're putting in the final numbers now. Um, so we should have some information at a later mm -hmm. date so we can report back to you on what the, the outcome was. Okay, thank you. And yeah. I, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Menchaca for drilling down on um, the adult literacy. Um, questions and issues. So I, I just want to say, um, why why don't we uh, fight to baseline negotiated ad from fiscal 2020 that totaled $12 million? Because we all agree these are vital services. Is that a question or a statement? I mean, I, 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 I've said uh, repeatedly, I think core programs should have stable funding. And so we've made that clear to OMB. Obviously they have to consider all other factors, but it's a relatively small sum of money that goes a long way uh, to helping people who really uh, have major challenges and are, are marginalized by uh, the pandemic more so than ever. Thank you, um, Commissioner Chong. And so my final statement, um, 
is basically um, about our relationship, Commissioner Chung and DYCD. So Commissioner Chung, this is our last budget dance. And I know I've stepped on your toes as we pirouetted around the budget and even suffered some missteps like the canceling of SYEP. It is good to see that our last tango is gladly more like a soft shoe with the full restorations, inclusions, and new additions. We just need to tweak, work, learn, grow. Um, so as we glide off the DYCD budget dance floor, um, I hope that with all the lessons that we've learned, that they will be passed on when the new team taps in. I wish you all the best. And to the rest of the team, I say thank you so much for all of your work. And please continue to push for universal SYP. And with well, that fair drum, I'm done. I know you're glad. <laughs> now we have one more. Our majority leader would like to ask questions. Lori Cumbo. Time starts now. Madam, Madam Majority Leader. Majority Leader, are you there? Can we hear you? Can you hear us? I think she might be having trouble I, with. Yeah, I don't see her. Oh. Is it Oh, she's muted. Can you hear me? She's muted. Uh, okay. I, unmuted I believe we have her now. Okay, okay, you have me now. Mom, I'm gonna clean that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my question really goes into the issues around gun violence. And while I know that we've put a lot of money into programming, my question goes more into, are there more specific measures that are specifically related to gun violence as it pertains to this budget. I, I love all of the programs from Summer Youth Employment to Sonic and many others. And those give our young people healthy options in terms of giving them productive things to do with their time. Mm -hmm. But has there been any thought in terms of how can we do something that's, that digs even deeper to the issues of gun violence um, in our dollars and in the work that we're doing? Well, I guess the big change I would say from last year is that the community centers will be open at night because we know that uh, we need to give positive uh, channels for young people to be active in their community. And when there's no opportunity to do anything positive, they become you know, caught in the, the cycle of violence that's affecting their neighborhoods. The other thing we're doing is we're working closely with the police department and their youth uh, officers whose main job, and this stunned me when I met with the police commissioner before the pandemic, the job of youth officers is not to fight crime, it's to connect young people to services. Because he said to me that by connecting young people to services is the best way to fight crime. And so we did a training, um, I want to say last fall at the police academy with uh, several hundred youth officers who are patrolling the streets on how to use the Discover DOICD app so that when they come across a young person who's hanging out on the street and you know those are the ones not in our programs, they can say, hey, do you know there's a community center right down the road here or there's this program down the road and this is how you apply because uh, while adults may have challenges applying online, uh, young person, that's second nature to them. So we're trying to figure out ways to better connect young people to services so they don't get uh, sucked into uh, bad elements in their neighborhood. And Majority Leader Combo, I would want to add, Commissioner, if you will, I would want to add that we are also um, expanding the Saturday Night Lights program from 20 to 100 as of July. So we're working with the NYPD, we're working with the DA's offices across the city, as well as NYCHA and Parks to expand that program. And in, in essence, that is also a violence prevention program, if you will. It's bringing additional enhanced services to 100 community centers throughout New York City um, 
we're, we're still identifying the sites, but th these are sites that are located in precincts and in neighborhoods of the highest crime throughout New York City, um, bringing those adult mentors to that space um, and creating an, a, a, a different type of synergy um, that hopefully and, and, and has been known to promote um, anti-violence. I just want to just close. There's an organization that I'm sure you're aware of, but I would also like to add in terms of, I wanted to see more done with them, this program called I Will Graduate. And it's a youth mentorship program um, that's doing really incredible work, particularly connecting our hip hop community with our young people around the campaign of graduating. So I would strongly um, advocate for that particular organization to be closer in your wheelhouse of organizations that you work with. But I also would like to add that I, I spoke to Mayor Bill de Blasio about this in terms of um, particularly like crime that's being impacted, uh, that's being created by young people, impacted by young people, um, and not created because they are, even the ones that are perpetuating the gun violence are really victims of, I guess, failures on our part and beyond. But what I would add is that um, we need to do more in terms of being more intentional about the gun violence impacting our communities. And we need to do it in a way in terms of having like a citywide campaign with credible messengers, whether they are bus ads, train ads, commercials, um, credible messengers mm -hmm. like those in the entertainment and athletic communities. Um, we really need to have more people from the Jay-Z's and the Nas's and whoever the young people are listening to, the Puff Daddies that are now um, engaged in government and politics, we need to have those credible mm -hmm. messengers mm -hmm. along with youth um, talking about the fact that New York City does have a gun violence problem and acknowledging it and utilizing our young people as well as credible messengers that they listen to, to be a part of it and really more education about what impact gun violence has on our communities and what it's doing so that you need to have a better understanding of how it's impacting our neighborhoods. So I think the programs are great, but I think there also has to be an intentionality about education. It's the same as things like such as sex education and, and so on. I'm expired. We can, them, we can give them summer programs and youth programs, but if we don't talk to them about how to prevent teenage pregnancy and how to better protect themselves, they're going to still fall victim to those things. So I just wanted to add that and thank you. I mean, I, I agree uh, with everything you said that I think uh, the city has to always do a better job of making sure young people stay on the right path. And programs are part of it, having uh, a caring adult in their lives, you know, uh, public education campaigns, all that. Uh, is part of the effort to, to keep uh, young people engaged and productive. So, uh, you know, some of these, we, we've got to, you know, this administration has, has a running start. I think, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Department of Youth Services never grown this much in the 25 year history of this. And hopefully I'll have an opportunity to sit down with my successor and hand the baton off to them and share some of these ideas. In the meantime, if you can pass on the, uh, name and contact information of that organization, we'll certainly work with them to figure out how we can uh, weave them into our, our toolbox. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank Council, you. is that it for questions? Yes, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanna read this statement before we close out. So just bear with me one minute. Okay, so uh, this will conclude today's hearing. Thank you, DYCD, for being here and for kicking off our hearings this year. Before we close, I'd like to remind the Finance Committee members uh, that we will be meeting remotely again tomorrow, beginning at 10 a.m., and we will hear from the Department of Aid for Aging, uh, the Department of Investigation, and the Department of Transportation. As a reminder to the public, the committee will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on Tuesday, May 25th at 10 a.m. If you would like to testify at the hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov testify 
and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may also submit written testimony through the registration website or by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you to all the members of DYCD. Could I say a few words? Sure, absolutely. So uh, to, to take a uh, bill off of uh, Chairwoman Rose's comments about the budget dances, somebody who uh, has two left feet, uh, despite that, uh, we've done great things for young people over the last eight years. Uh, and I think uh, the city's in a better place. Young people are in a better place because of the partnership between the city and the city council. And I'm hoping that our respective successors uh, set a higher bar. Uh, this is just a foundation. And uh, I look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of you in person before uh, I end my tenure. I've, I've been fully vaccinated, so I'm looking forward <laughs> to doing normal life. But thank you again for your partnership. Thank you again, Commissioner. I'm fully vaccinated. Debbie, are you? Yes, I am. Yes. All right, we're going to yes. go out for coffee. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> So, Let's so, treat though. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. You. Thank you, DYCD. And with Thank that, this you. meeting is adjourned at 12 13 p.m. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.